All right, all right, all right. Let's get started. Let's get started. Um, so, all right, all right, settle down, settle down. Okay, so uh, number one, you all just got back your homework number eight. Um, upon review, I realized there's, there actually weren't any hook problems on the homework, right? Yeah. So um, what I did was this. Um, on the solution, instead of the solution being for 720A, it was just for 720. So you've got the hook problem that goes along with it. There's really not a whole lot to it, but that way you have something to go off of. It's, I mean, it, it's really plug and chug. In fact, what, I mean, like the epoxy factor, you actually get the epoxy factor from 720A. So it's really not a whole lot to, um, uh, whole lot to get into there. So there's that. <coughs> Excuse me. One, two. Is there something going on today, or is there like a wreck, or? <laughs> this is the day you'll want to be here. <laughs> this is the day you'll want to be here, because we're talking about some, some interaction stuff today. And you're, you're short one? Where is he? Can I see your Did he get one? That's, that's right. Can I see your concrete book? Does it have it with you? Yeah. I'm, I'm happy to do that. You know, what if I, what if I just like didn't record today? Be fun. What if I just didn't record today? Do it. Do it. You know what I might do? I might leave the recording on, but then I'm gonna unlist the video, so you don't have the link until the end. For the folks that aren't here, that'd just be mean, wouldn't it? Just turn the microphone off. <laughs> that just writing on the screen. Look, like, don't know where all this is coming from. Make the wrong stuff and then list the unlisted correct video. Uh, I'm not that mean. They're they're uh they're just. What's that? What? I don't understand. Now I understand where you're coming from. I was about to say, like, what are you talking about? Okay. All right, let's make sure everybody's clear on the schedule because it seemed that, that in, uh, in steel design, a lot of folks were doing the, the homework like on Friday morning or... or What's that? Now I can't I can't help what's going on in your other classes. The only thing that I can do, the only thing that I can do is post the homework schedule like three weeks in advance. So that's all I can do. Yes. So is this in the area of like tension bars and single layer? Yes. I'll be. Did, did anybody get wrong on that? I got a point off, and I know he got a point off. Okay. Um, tell you what. All right, all right, all right. Hey, yo, yo. Okay. I, I, I will be the first person to admit I have a mistake on my solution on problem, which is first one or the second one? Second one. On the second problem, I had N equals 3 on my solution, and the uh, uh, answer is N equals 4 uh, or for that. If, let's just do this. If you want your point back, just stack it up here, and I will give you your point back. Is it the first one? Or wait, no, it's the second one. I'm not doing that. What? What are you... What do you yeah, yeah. I haven't gotten the steel homeworks yet. How do I know if I got marked off by this? Well, does it? Okay, now I don't know what to say about that, so.
Well, speaking of, I am going to need graders for next year, so so if anybody's interested. Yes? What's that? <laughs> now, if you were here on time. I haven't, I, haven't, I haven't passed it out yet. And you haven't gotten your homework either because you weren't on time. <laughs> Okay, this got complicated. Let's just keep this simple. Who needs a solution? Raise your hand. I mean, like, raise your hand high, like super high so I can see it. There we go. Did I take it? Well, then you still need a solution. So. Okay. No, I'm correcting it. I could just leave it, then it would be a mistake. So it's more, I guess it's more about what's more valuable. Do you want to add a mistake to the counter or do you want your point back? So you can't have it both ways. So whenever I make a mistake in all my homework and I get it back, I can correct it? I can correct it. You can do whatever you want. <laughs> all right. Hold on. All right, everybody, settle down. Who did not get homework nine, the homework that's due on Friday? When I have copies, it means some of you do not, okay? That's, that's how that goes, so. All right, everybody is aware that the homework is due on Friday, okay? Are you okay with that? If you're not, I'm sorry. <laughs> but it's still due on Friday. Our exam is Monday, May the 1st, okay? Uh, on Friday, when you turn in your homework, I'm not accepting late work because I'm giving you the solution that day. So if it's not there at 10 o'clock on the dot, that's it, okay? Everybody okay with that? All right. So today, what we're going to do is we're going to finish our column design topic, which I don't think we have a whole lot left in. And then we're going to discuss beam columns. And the, the funky part about beam columns is we need, first off, we actually have to go back a little bit uh, conceptually and talk about doubly reinforced sections in order to appropriately talk about beam columns. But um, we also have to discuss the concept of interaction. And, and for those of you that are in steel design, we've actually talked about interaction a while back. If you recall, uh, for those of you in steel, we did bolts and shear and bolts and tension. And if you recall, if you have a bolt that's experiencing both shear and tension, you can't expect it to develop simultaneously 100% of its shear capacity and 100% of its tensile capacity. That's not how it works. You end up getting reduced a little bit. You all remember that? Well, the same concept applies for beam columns. If you have a section that's being subjected to axial load and bending, you can't expect it to develop 100% of its axial capacity and 100% of its moment capacity. There's a little bit of a relationship that, that goes there. So you have, to, you have to develop that relationship, and it takes a little bit of work. So uh, hopefully we will try and explain that, um, explain that today. One final point. Um, I don't have it on this slide because I didn't have time to change my slide this morning, but course evals. I have, so far, I haven't actually had very many of you respond. Again, if there's something that you think needs to change about the class, let me know. But I, I won't know unless you do the survey. And again, you do the survey, that's just free points. So, um, again, you can rake me over the coals, say I'm the worst professor you've ever had, just do the survey. So, um, well, thank you. Now, did I get a sign-in sheet started? Yeah. Okay, good. All right. So, I believe this is where we left off. We were looking at example 19B. Okay. Now, um, let's just sort of recap where we were at. So we had a, um, a column that was subjected to a factored load of uh, uh, 768 kips. Now it's a spiral column, so our phi value and our alpha value changed, right? We go through and do the math and we get a required gross area and a required, well, required diameter of 18.4 inches. Now what I decided to do was I said, you know what? 
Let's, uh, let's not use 20 inches. Let's actually round down. Let's use a diameter of 18 inches. 18 inches is a very common column size, and that's going to be easy to, uh, to form up or easy to use uh, pre-made forms if that's what you're using. I mean, 18 inches is a very common dimension. Um, but, we can't, but because I'm doing that, we can't just take that 18 inches and multiply it by 0.02 and just say, oh, that's how much steel we need. We have to solve for it. But that's sort of the fortunate um, uh, circumstance of how we're doing our, our design. We solve for a required gross area and then pick a dimension. Once we get that dimension, we then use that dimension to solve for the required amount of steel. We do the math and we get, uh, we ended up needing 5.997 square inches, so just use six number nines. <coughs> Sound good? Okay. Now that's where we left off, so any questions? All right. Now. The one thing that's left is we, that we need to do is our spiral selection. So, Okay, now here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to start off, once this doesn't get tangled, spiral selection. Let's try out a number three spiral. Now I'm trying a number three because that's the absolute minimum that the spec allows. Okay? And if I do the math and I find that a number three spiral isn't going to work because I don't have enough steel to, to confine the column, well then I'll just use a number four or a number five. Um, but for now let's try a number three. Now a couple things about a number three spiral uh, that I need. Number one, I need the, um, the diameter of that spiral, and I need the area of that spiral. So you tell me. So number three, what's the diameter? <coughs> Say it again. Three-eighths. Three now what's the area? Well, if it's a circle and has a diameter of three-eighths, I think you all can do that. Or you can look it up. Now this is a number three. Well, I mean, what's the area of a number three bar? We've been using that all semester. 0 0.11. There we go. OK. All right. So in order to do spiral selection, we need to do a, a couple things. We're also going to assume 1.5 inches of cover. So if I want to determine the core diameter, it's going to be 18 inches minus two covers. Everybody okay with that? Bless you. So if I've got the core diameter, I can get the core area quite easily, just pi over 4d squared. So what is that? <coughs> okay. 176.7 square inches. There we go. Okay, everybody okay on that? Okay. So the reason why I need the core diameter is because I need to know what is my minimum allowable reinforcement ratio, or spiral reinforcement ratio, I guess I should say. And that's 0 0.45 AG over AC minus 1 times FC prime over FY. So plug and chug, 0 0.45. And what is AG again? Did we calculate that before? So 265 will say 0.8. Huh? Oh. So that oh that was the old one. Okay, so what's our actual? There you go. 0.7.
and then 4 KSI 60. Okay, so what do we get? Say it again. All right. Have a second on that? Okay, we got a 3 2, a 3 4, a 3 7. Three, two. All right. Okay. Okay, all right. So let me be clear what we just computed. We computed how much reinforcement is required to adequately confine the core of that column. Okay? So we need about, you know, what is it, 1.32 percentage of, of spiral reinforcement if you want to look at it like that. Now, if we've got... Let's, let's think about this. Let's use our, use our noggins here. This is how much spiral reinforcement we're going to need. Now, we've assumed a spiral size. Now, if I've got a spiral size and I have how much I need, what's the only thing left? What do I need to solve for? I mean, how do I specify spiral reinforcement? I say number threes at two, at two inches or at two and a half inches. I need the spacing. So that's what I got to solve for. I got to determine how how space or how far apart those uh, increments need to be spaced. Does that make sense? Okay. So now to calculate the reinforcement ratio, just in general, you would compute it by saying four times the area of the spiral times DC minus DB divided by S times the diameter of the core squared. Like that's how you compute the actual spiral reinforcement ratio. Okay? I propose that this is what we're going to do. We're going to calculate an S by just solving this equation and saying 4 AS DC minus DB divided by DC squared times rho. And in this case, I'm going to use rho S minimum. Is everybody okay with that? Now, let's be clear on before we start plugging and chugging. When I compute this spacing, is it going to be a maximum allowable spacing or a minimum allowable spacing? A maximum, yeah. Because if it says 2.2 inches, we got to go lower than that, right? You see what I mean? So that's going to be whatever we compute, this is going to be, let me, write that as S max. Okay? So S max equals 4 times 0 0.11 square inches times uh, 15 inches minus uh, 3 eighths and then that row times 15 squared. Don't forget to square the 15. Now, everything's in inches, so our units are simple. 2.17, is that what you got? So, 2.17 inches. So, I propose, here's your column. And forgive me for the art, because it's a circle, so I'm going to do the best I can. Oh, it's going to get worse. I told you it was getting worse. <laughs> I, 
All right, so number three is at two inches. This is one and a half inches. Um, we're using six number nines, and we're using a column that's 18 inches. Two o'clock and counterclockwise. Oh my God. That's not bad. <laughs> All right. Any questions? <laughs> Correctly. Okay, does everybody have all this? Or do you want me to leave it up here for a second? Yes. All right, hey, 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 someone else. Yeah. That's a good question. Um, I guess, you know, technically we would need to go through and check that. I mean, you want me to be honest with you? The easiest way is probably to open up MicroStation and just check it. But you're talking about clear bar spacing for these. Like I'm talking about literally just measuring that. So. And honestly, I would just, yeah. I mean, I know there's a formula out there, but I'm, I'm lazy. I, to be honest, I think it would be easier to just open up AutoCAD draw and yeah, that's what I would do. I can practice, that's what I would do. I mean, you're going to have to draft it out anyways. So. Well, you you maybe you you have to get that straight line distance there. All right. <laughs> Everybody good on this? Okay. If you're good on that, then then this is where you kind of need to pay attention because this is where things are going to get a little funky and bring things back. Okay. All right. So now what I want to do is I want to discuss our final topic of the semester, which is called beam columns. And this is going to be a little bit like movie time, but uh, I'm going to do my best to try and take it one step at a time and make sure this makes sense. Okay. So let's look at this. I have a, uh, a column being subjected to an axial load. Okay. Um, now. Our fundamental design expression that we've been using this entire semester states that VPN has to be greater than or equal to PU. Our factored resistance must be greater than or equal to our factored loads. Now that's math, so I can rewrite that, and I could say that the ratio of PU over VPN has to be uh, less than or equal to 1. I mean, PU over VPN, you could think of that as an efficiency cap, and the efficiency has to be less than or equal to 1, okay? That would work just fine, right? That would be a, a very basic limit state equation. Now, that expression would work for members subjected to only axial load. Okay? What if I have a member that's subjected to moment? Well, I could do the same thing. And I can say, instead of phi mn has to be greater than or equal to mu, I can state that mu over phi mn has to be less than or equal to 1. And that's another uh, expression. Right? Now, what I propose is this. A simplified interaction relationship would be something like this. What if you have axial load and bending moment subjected to a section? Or, yeah, both of them on there. I say, well, how about this? How about this ratio and that ratio added up? They've got to be less than one, right? And each one on their own right has to be less than or equal to one. It seems to make sense that uh, the sum of them together would be less than or equal to one. That is a very simple, very simple expression of an interaction. The interaction between axial load and bending moment. That acting together, they have to be less than or equal to 1. Okay? Now, the problem with that is it's actually, it greatly, and I mean prohibitively, underestimates the capacity of a reinforced concrete column. See, 
when when you add bending moment to a column, a lot of times it helps. Or if you add axial load to a beam, I guess that would be the best way of putting it. Um, when you add axial load to a beam, it helps. Think about it like this. Beams are made of reinforced concrete, and concrete is a material that is weak in tension. So if you take a beam and add compression to it, how would that hurt the scenario? Do, do you see what I mean? I mean, if you take a beam and you lock in a compressive force, there's a name for that type of beam. It's called a pre-stress beam. Okay? That's the whole concept. All right? And I want to at least illustrate that, though, not from a pre-stress standpoint, but from an interaction standpoint. Now we can uh, observe this effect through an interaction diagram. You, you might hear me call interaction diagrams PM curves. Okay? Now, I want to show you an example of how you would generate a PM curve. Okay? Let's take a look at this column. Okay? This column is subjected to, uh, well, it, it's going to be subjected to loads that we're going to see. We're going to uh, refer to them as acting at various eccentricities. We'll get to that here in a little bit. Uh, but the column is uh, four K made of 4 KSI concrete and 60 KSI steel. Now, I've got four number nines in that column, and this is just for illustrative purposes. Um, we'll say that the cover on each of those bars is 3 inches, and the column is 18 by 18. Now, we're going to assume that we're taking this and bending it about the, uh, the, the dashed line or the x-axis. Okay? So if I were to treat that section as a beam, that's not just any regular old beam. That's a doubly reinforced beam, right? That has steel in the tensile regions and the compression regions. Everybody okay with that? All right. Okay. <clears throat> what I'm going to do is I'm going to generate a table of some X and Y points. And we're going to plot those points and see what this looks like. Now, let's start off by considering a really simple case. All right. A really simple case that... Um, <laughs> M equals zero. No moment at all. Well, if there is no moment on that section, its capacity is just its pure axial capacity. The 0.85 FC prime times the area of steel plus Fy times the area, uh, or plus, or 0.85 FC prime times the area of the concrete and Fy times the area of the steel. I messed that one up. Now, if you'll notice, so, so if I do the math, I get a capacity of about 1328 kips. Now, for now, we're ignoring uh, that eccentricity. We're also ignoring phi. We'll apply those later at the very end. Everybody with me on that? So if you want to think of an x and y coordinate, we have uh, a point that's essentially uh, 1328 on the p-axis, and on the m-axis, we have 0. Everybody okay with that? That's one point on this curve. Now let's do the flip side. Okay, now let's uh, deal with pure bending. Well, if we're in pure bending, we're dealing with a doubly reinforced section, right? We have an AS prime and an AS, a D and a D prime. Y'all remember all that? Remember this where you had to solve for the neutral axis, that quadratic equation? Remember that? No, it's been a while. Um, well, I want to analyze that beam and let's see what happens. So we've got our quadratic expression. Remember, we have our quadratic term, our linear term, our constant term. Go through and get our uh, quadratic equation, Casio FX115 ES plus, right? Go through and do that, and you get a C value of 2.69 inches. We can take that C value and then uh, plug and chug into our moment expression. Remember, A is beta 1 C. You all can go through and do the, the, the math, and you'll get an MN is uh, 14 or 141.65 foot kips. So here's a, another um, uh, point to consider. We have a moment on the moment axis of 141.65 and a p-value of zero. So see how it's the opposite? See, see how we're getting that? Now, so those are the two extremes, you know, pure axial load, pure bending. What about anywhere in the middle? Okay. In order to do something in the middle, this is how this would work. Okay. We start off by guessing, uh, this is probably the easiest way to do it. We start off by guessing a c-value, a distance or a depth of the new, uh, neutral axis. Based on that depth of the neutral axis, remember how the depth of the neutral axis, you can get the strain in the steel, the strain in the concrete, you know, you can get the strains. And if you get the strain in the steel, you can get the stresses in the steel. And if you get the stresses in the steel, you can get the forces in the steel. Make sense? All right, so you go through and you do all that. And then you use just sum of forces in the x direction and sum of moments to determine 
what's the uh, unbalanced axial load and what's the moment, and then there's your capacity. And this is a great problem to do in Excel. So to give you an idea of how this would work, let's just blanketly guess a value of C equals 11 inches. I'm just guessing a value. Based on that C value, I can determine the strain in the top layer of steel, the strain in the bottom layer of steel. So I can note this, and I can look, well, the top layer of steel has yielded, the bottom layer hasn't. And that might be, seem like a really odd result, but again, we're not talking about a pure beam. We're talking about a beam that's, or an element that's seen a fair amount of axial load, too. So it's very possible to get those, those odd results. So if I look, the top layer of steel has yielded, the bottom layer hasn't. So the top layer is seeing 60 KSI, the bottom layer is seeing whatever that strain is times 29,000. Everybody with me on that? Okay. Now, the forces in the concrete, what do I have? I got 0.85 FC prime times AB, so beta 1 CB. See where I'm getting that? And then the stresses in the steel are the area times the stress. So, pretty straightforward. Everybody okay on that? Now, what you're going to find is that if I do C plus or C equals T, it's not going to work. Okay? Why does C not equal T? Well, the difference is however much axial load is on the section. Make sense? So, some forces sum up all my compression, uh, subtract out all my tension. The axial load on the section that is going to bring that into equilibrium is 628.95 kips. And then go through in some moments and you'll end up getting a moment of about 287. So, here's a few points to this curve. I've got the two extremes. And then for the one in the middle, I just guessed a C value of 11 inches. See, the reason why this is a great Excel problem is this is guessing C equals 11. In Excel, I can just do C equals 10, C equals 9, C equals 8, C equals 7, C equals 6. I can just guess a boatload of them and just have Excel plotted out. And when you plot it out, you get a curve that looks something like this. Okay? So this is an, a PM curve. This is an interaction curve for the column that we just defined. Okay? Now, I want everybody to watch this because this is... Your, uh, the scale is really important here. Now, first off, let's, let's take a look at this point right here, that point right there. There's no axial load at all, and it can withstand a just shy of about 150 foot kips in moment, right? Well, watch what happens when I start putting some axial load on there. Like, what if I put about 300 kips of axial force on there? I get a heck of a benefit, right? Because that's more compression. The beam likes that, right? You're neglecting some of that tension. So in bending, it can resist a whole lot more bending. So see how that works out? It's pretty nifty, isn't it? Pretty nifty how that works out. Now, this is a nominal PM curve. I want everybody to watch this. Okay, so here's the nominal PM curve. Watch that. See what happened? Now, what happened? I cut the curve off. Why did I cut the curve off? That's alpha equals 0.8. That's your eccentricity factor. Everybody okay with that? Now, what else is missing? Or that. The other way. What else is missing is feed values. Now, if you notice, you get sort of a weird little, like, the, the, the dolphin-looking thing. Dolphin. The reason why the curve changes from being this smooth transition to that is because remember what happens to your what is phi in general? Well, yeah, it's your safety factor. <laughs> but what is phi? Seriously, remember it's here. I'm gonna go back. I'm gonna. Let, I'm gonna go way back for this. One. Hold on. I'm going way back. I'm bringing it back. Now hold on. For a square column, what's phi? For a square column, what is phi? No. 0.65. Remember that? For a square column, for a circular column, it's 0.75. I want everybody to look at this. Remember that? Remember your phi value is 0.9 for tension-controlled regions. It's a linear fit for transition regions. Well, what about compression-controlled regions? What do you think a column is? It's the one big compression-controlled region. This curve, and this is something I've sort of kept from you all all semester because I wanted this to make sense now, but this curve actually looks like that for a circular. 
and this is 0 0.75. It's linear, yeah. See, I'm, that was bad, I know. It's a bad line. I'm drawing to it. Uh, the circles are, are getting to me. Okay, does this make sense? Everybody okay with this? That's the reason why, you know, that's the reason why uh, that curve sort of has that little dolphin nose, uh, as it was put, right here. Because in that region, your phi is changing. Because it's not, it, look, it's not here, it's only the phi value. So obviously the phi did that, so that's why. Sound good? Okay, now here's the thing. Let me see what time it is. Oh, we're doing good. Here's the thing. Um, beam columns are fairly tough to design if you've got to draw one of those for every single column, even if you don't know what it looks like, that's kind of tough. Okay? So, luckily, there's a lot of design aids that have been made available by ACI and organizations like this, and they're called PM curves or interaction charts. Some of you are already turning to them in your notes, and they, they kind of look kind of look like this, okay? So let me show you how they work. Um, you use the curve uh, based on the following dimensionless parameters. If you go through and look at the dimensions, these actually don't have any dimensions at all, so that they make the curves uh, or the, the, the aids easy to use. <coughs> this KN uh, term is really more related to the axial load. The RN term is really more related to the moment. What you end up getting is something that looks like this. Okay, now let me explain what you're looking at here, okay? What you're looking at is a dimensionless set of PM curves that are discretized based on, so the ones you see right here are discretized based on, first off, reinforcement ratio. How many actual curves do you have going like this? Well, what we got? We got 0 0.01, 0 0.02, 0 0.03, 0 0.04, 0 0.05, 0 0.06, 0 0.07. We have eight. Why do we have eight of them? Well. <laughs> go back a little bit. Do you all remember, let's see, remember that? Your steel reinforcement ratio is limited between 1% and 8%. So what they did in the age is they just drew one for every increment. So if you're in between, you just interpolate. Okay? Make sense? Okay. So you'll notice you've got each of these different, you know, curves. You would just interpolate in between. So the way it works is this. When you're in design mode and you have a general idea of your um, dimensions, you would just say, all right, go this far on the x-axis for Rn, go this far on the y-axis for Kn, you know, find your point, and that's how much steel you put in. It's that simple. Okay? You'll note, see this line right here? Everybody see that? And there's one right there. What does that say? K max. You know why it says K max? That is that, that cutoff. If you notice, right there, right there, right there, right there. That's what we're talking about. That's that cutoff. Look at this curve right here. See how that's about 1 and that's about 0 0.8? See that? That's what's going on. That's that cutoff term is right there. And you notice each of these lines that you see here are based on different just common strain conditions. Like this strain condition right here is when the uh, stress in the steel actually equals Fy. It's what's called the balance point uh, sometimes. Um, everybody okay with this so far? Now let's look at the naming conventions. Now I've got interaction diagram L 460.6. Can I see that? And then over here on the right, I've got C4060.8. Does everybody see that? Okay. All right. Design aid legend. So L stands for a rectangular column with two layers of steel. And R stands for a column with three layers of steel. So you'll notice the difference because... Um, There'll be like, you know, your top layer, your bottom layer, and then there'll be the bars in the middle. That'll be your, uh, your rectangular columns with three layers of steel. C stands for circular columns, okay? So does everybody see that? Do you all have that design aid with you? You all have it? 
You should. I plan that stuff out sometimes. Sometimes. Okay. So if I was looking at L460.7, that would be a rectangular column with two layers of steel. The 4 and the 60 stand for 4 KSI concrete and 60 KSI steel. The 7. The 7 stands for this gamma ratio. So if you look right here, like if you've got a column, let's say, that's 20 inches wide, and this dimension's, let's say, 14, so if that's 14 and then that's 20, gamma would be 14 over 20 and it would be 0.7. Does that make sense? So, <coughs> everybody okay with this? So, let's say this is 20 inches. Let's say that's 14 from that right there and then that's 20. Then gamma would be 0.7, 14 over 20. Does that make sense? That's just that ratio from the, it tells you how far apart your steel space, essentially. Sound good? So here's how this works from a design standpoint. Okay, so start off, we say, all right, let's determine the factored load and the factored moment. Um, let's determine our required PN and MN. And what we'll do is we'll just assume a feed value of 0.65. And I can imagine some of you are going, well, wait a minute. I thought it was a different fee value for columns than it was for beams. True, but it's the same loading condition, so you're going off your worst case scenario. So our fee value is going to be, we're just going to assume 0.65 and 0.75. We determine our eccentricity. So what I mean by eccentricity is, like I've got an axial load and a bending moment. I could represent that as just a single axial load that's off-center sum. And that off-center is the eccentricity. It's just the moment divided by the load. So once I've got the, ex, uh, the eccentricity, I can compute the Kn and the Rn, and then just use the uh, uh, interpolation charts to find the reinforcement ratio. Once I got the reinforcement ratio, multiply to get the amount of steel, and that's it. Now, if your gamma, let's say your gamma is something like 0.65, so you look up the value for 0.6, look up the value for 0.7, and interpolate. That's about it. Any questions? Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to let you all out early today because I'm not starting this example today. I want to start this example start to finish on Monday. Think about it. This is our last example in concrete design. Example 20. This is it. Does anybody have any questions? All right, guys. Monday we will do this. Right now, you should have the ability to attack problems one and two on your homework. Really, I would get a start on as soon as you can. Um, problem three, you can do after Monday. We will not have class on Wednesday. Friday, you turn in your homework. We have exam review. And that's it. That's all I got.